Hello friends, and welcome to Volume 5 of Irish Man Talks About Japanese PS1 Games, the show where we take a deep dive into the vast ocean that is the Japanese PlayStation Library, searching for all sorts of buried treasure, while also avoiding all the bottom-feeding pachinko games in the process. So, as always, in today's episode, we are going to take a look at three Japan-only PlayStation games. We're going to take our joint list of games, randomize the list, take the top 100, and then add them all into a big spinning prize wheel. We're then going to spin the wheel three times, and whatever the wheel lands on will be our games for today's showcase. I hope you're ready for a treat because there is really nothing else quite like the Japanese PS1 library, and as always, I am very excited to see what's in store. What three games are we going to play today? Well, as long as we place our trust in the wheel, I assure you, it will provide. <laughs> will provide. Volume 5's first game is Motor 2 and Grand Prix, released in December 1994, making this one of the earliest games released on the platform. Now some of you may be thinking, Sean, you big idiot, I've played Motor 2 and Grand Prix, this game came out in the West, it isn't a Japan only release. Well I've some bad news, you've been lied to. Yes, a game called Motor 2 and Grand Prix did come out in the West, but that game is actually Motor 2 and Grand Prix 2, also sometimes known as Motor 2 and Grand Prix USA. Yeah, it can get pretty confusing. Let's not dwell on it too much. So yeah, this 1994 Japan-only release is the real Motor 2 Grand Prix, and this right here is one of the earliest racing games released on the platform, coming out only a few weeks after the PlayStation's Japanese launch on December 3rd, 1994. This game is also the debut release of a dev team called Polly's Entertainment, who went on to create, oh, I don't know, only a little game called Omega Boost, and also some other racing games. I'm sure they're not too important. So yeah, this game is not only the origins of Polyphony Digital, one of Sony's most prolific studios, but it also represents the PlayStation during its baby years, when the console was really trying to just make a name for itself. So let's see how the original OG Motor 2 and Grand Prix holds up all these years later. The game features a few different single player modes and even split screen multiplayer which is a nice addition for the time, but the main single player content is the Grand Prix mode. In this mode, you can select from one of five different racers and race across a grand total of three tracks. Yes, that may not seem like much, but honestly for the time, this was about what was expected from a 3D racer. The racing itself is very simple. It follows the usual arcade style of the time where you start each race in last place and need to work your way up to the front before you cross the finish line three laps later. It plays somewhat like a hybrid between an arcade racer and a kart racer. Now, for the most part, the racing itself is very traditional. You don't have to worry about items or any of the usual wacky kart racer madness. Really, it's just pure driving, for the most part. There are still some aspects that feel more akin to something you'd see in a kart racer, like a dedicated drift button that really makes some of the sharper turns in the game a breeze, and also these crystals, which at first I thought were item boxes, but really the only thing these do is set off a kind of roulette, which sometimes replaces your car with a big version of the driver that then runs wild for a few seconds through the track. It doesn't increase your speed very much, but it looks weird, so I kind of love it. And yeah, that's really all there is to the racing. Do some driving, drift here and there, and every now and then turn into a walking insurance disaster. It's quite simple by today's standards, but genuinely for 1994, the racing here is still really good and responsive, better than many other PlayStation racers that will come after it. But of course, a racing game is nothing without its tracks, and the three that are here, honestly, I like these quite a lot. The first track, Toon Island, is the most traditional track, great for getting you used to the game's controls and featuring some colourful green hills and a few tricky turns. The second track, Plastic Lake, is by far my favourite track in the game, because this thing looks like a vaporwave paradise. It's got lots of weird sights and uh, strange track design, but honestly, it's a ton of fun to race through. The final track, Gulliver House, is another great one too. It's definitely the most difficult track with tons of objects to avoid and alternate routes to take, but it's another really interesting one on the visual front, and it's a lot of fun. 
Really, the three tracks here are all winners in my book, but the problem with a limited number like this is that it won't be long until repetition sets in. And sure, you can beat the game with various characters and try the harder difficulties, but really the only reward for coming in first place is getting to view a replay of your winning effort, which, in fairness, does look pretty impressive by 94 standards. Now I guess it is a bit of a lie to say that the game only has three tracks, as there are multiple other tracks designed specifically for split screen multiplayer. Thankfully you can also access these tracks in the game's time trial mode, and while it is nice to have some extra tracks available, these are way more basic in design compared to the three Grand Prix tracks, and are just nowhere near as fun to race on. I imagine the reason these tracks are so basic in visuals and design is to maintain the game's frame rate in split screen mode, as the more impressive Grand Prix tracks are not selectable there, which I guess is understandable. Speaking of the frame rate, the game operates at a pretty much rock solid 30 frames per second. The racing is smooth, the gameplay is tight. As far as performance goes, this is a great effort all round. I think the game's somewhat simple visual design also lends to the good frame rate. You'll notice the game has a lot of flat textures, which really give it a clean look that I genuinely think looks quite nice. What we lack in environmental detail, we make up for with bright clean colours, and in places like Plastic Lake, it can actually look quite striking. The vehicles and characters themselves certainly have a lot more detail, and they also look really nice. I've always been a big fan of the series' most iconic feature, which is how the vehicles sway comically from side to side while racing, to give it that little cartoony edge. It's a very nice touch. On the sound front, the game is not all that impressive. I think some of the car sound effects and the turn noises can sound a little weak, but the game's soundtrack is nice at least. Plenty of catchy tunes that suit the themes of the different tracks. My only issue with the game outside of the small amount of content is the character selection. The game has five characters, but the balance on these guys isn't the best. The game's main character, Captain Rock, is significantly faster than the other racers, and some of them are so slow, you'll be lucky to finish a race in fifth place. If you want to win, you pick Captain Rock, and this makes me very sad when I could be playing as some penguins instead. So overall, Motor 2 and Grand Prix is surprisingly good all these years later. It's certainly rather simple and suffers from a lack of content, but what's here is really fun, and I could see racing fans and people who dig the aesthetics of early 3D games really having some fun here. Out of curiosity, I tried the follow-up after playing this game, since I'd never actually played this one myself either, but I figured it would be good to give you all a brief overview of what's changed since the original. We've got a few extra modes, a roster of 8 characters, and now 10 tracks to race on. Two of which, Toon Island 2 and Gulliver House 2, of course making their way over from the original. And it is an absolute shame that Plastic Lake didn't make the cut. The driving here is a little bit different. The dedicated drift button is now gone, and it plays a little more like a traditional racer now. Except for the fact that they've also added items now too. The graphics are also quite different. There's definitely more detail to everything, but I'd also say that it makes the game look somewhat worse in certain ways too. For one, the cars don't bounce about anywhere near as much, so frankly it's unplayable. In the end, I unintentionally played through the entirety of this game as well because it, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a definite improvement over the first game, but it's also rather different in some ways too. If you only had to pick one, the second game is the best choice, but I wouldn't completely write off trying the first game either. It's still very good in its own right, and it's also very import friendly. So there you go, maybe you learned a bit about the Motor 2 and Grand Prix series today. I know I sure did. It's an interesting footnote in PlayStation history, certainly not as fondly remembered as the racing series that would precede it, but I can see why it's loved by the people who do. Whether you check out the Japan only original or its follow up, Motor 2 and Grand Prix is a series definitely worth your time. will provide
Next up is IS Internal Section, released on the PlayStation in January 1999 and developed by a studio called Positron in collaboration with Squaresoft, the game's publisher. And as I'm sure you know, if Squaresoft has its name tied to something released on the PS1, well, you're probably in for a treat. So first things first, the game opens with a photo sensitivity warning, so if anybody watching at home is sensitive to flashing lights or overstimulation, well this is your heads up. So I'm sure people might be aware of a subgenre of shoot 'em ups known as tunnel shooters. The most famous of these is probably the granddaddy of the genre, the 1981 Atari release Tempest. Personally I have not played many games in the genre, but I have tried out the wonderful Tempest 2000 on the Atari Jaguar, which many would consider the best game on the whole platform. But the PS1 also has a few great tunnel shooters, including a reworking of Tempest 2000 called Tempest X3, and my personal favourite, a game called N2O Nitrous Oxide. Well, IS is also a tunnel shooter, and look, I'll be upfront with you, this is probably the best one I've ever played. So just to make sure we have the basics covered, in a tunnel shooter you're essentially moving forward automatically on a rail, but you also have the ability to rotate 360 degrees around the play area while you shoot inwards towards enemies and also dodge projectiles and hazards coming towards you. It's as simple to pick up and play as it was in the 80s and the gameplay is still a lot of fun even today. As always, the goal is simply just to make it to the end of the level, dying as little as possible while also scoring as many points as you can in the process. Enemies come at you in waves and if you kill all the enemies in a wave before they escape, you score big points. The game features a total of 8 stages and they are each broken up into 4 sections labelled A, B, C and D. These sections each act as a sort of checkpoint during each level and if you die at any point in the game, which you probably will since it's a one hit death, well then you'll respawn at the beginning of the last section you reached. Although the game is super forgiving with infinite continues, so dying really has very little penalty in this game. When you reach the end of the stage, you also have to take on the area boss, and in these sections the gameplay actually changes up with you now being able to move freely in a circular area around the boss. One of the coolest features that sets this game apart is the fact that you're uh, ship thing is equipped with 12 different weapons from the very beginning of the game, with each of these 12 weapons being based on an animal from the Chinese Zodiac. The weapons can offer up some useful abilities like rapid fire shots, flamethrowers, homing attacks and some more situational weapons that can hit targets at the center of the tunnel rather than the edges. The weapon variety also allows for a lot of flexibility with how you tackle the game but there are also sections clearly designed with certain weapons in mind, so it pays to know the best option for the situation. Also the weapons change your ship's colour and shape, which is a really nice visual touch. Not all weapons are created equal though, you will find some weapons like the monkey and tiger shot can pretty much carry you through the entire game, whereas weapons like ox almost feel useless in comparison. This can sometimes be an issue as you do have to cycle around through 12 weapons using the L1 and R1 button before you get to the weapon that you want, so it sometimes can be a little bit difficult to find the one that you need in a pinch. But don't worry, if you like you can also edit down your weapon selection and choose their order, so if you want to tailor it to something that suits your playstyle, go right ahead. Of course, as is tradition, if your weapons ever fail you, you also have access to a screen clearing bomb in a pinch. Really the gameplay here is just excellent all round. The game makes sure to mix things up beyond simple shooting by adding loads of sections that test your reflexes and control, and even puzzle sections that somehow just all work so well. The bosses are all fantastic too, there was never a point where I wasn't looking forward to reaching a boss and seeing what new wacky challenge I'd be coming up against. These will test your skills, but more importantly they're just really, really fun to play against. So look, based on the gameplay this is a pretty good video game, no doubt about it, but really the thing that elevates this game to the next level is its incredible presentation and sense of style. IS runs at a flawless 60 frames per second and has genuinely some of the most striking visuals on the whole console. This game uses flat shaded untextured polygons which not only boost the game's performance significantly, allowing it to run as smooth as it does using the PlayStation's high resolution mode, but if anything it actually makes the game look more modern than almost any other game on the console. I think it's hard not to look at the game and immediately think of Res, which is one of my all time favourite games. Res is known for its striking visual and audio design and how well it melds those elements into the gameplay. Well IS pretty much does this too, albeit nearly 3 years before Res even came out, and if I'm being honest it looks and plays just as good. Genuinely there were times that I died in this game just because I was too distracted by the backgrounds, which is probably a knock on the game but look, I know it's my own fault. You might worry that having such intense visuals going on in the background might lead to some easy deaths but don't worry, it genuinely is user error on my part as all the enemy projectiles and hazards are very clearly highlighted and difficult to miss. 
The best visual effects are usually reserved for the bosses. There's one boss that's made of cubes who breaks apart as you work your way inwards. There's another boss who just spits cubes and projectiles out of you, which looks really, really cool. There's also a newspaper for some reason. The newspaper is also very hard. My personal favorite though is this boss, which you slowly chip away at piece by piece. The effect here used to show damage is so simple, but it's just so satisfying to see in motion. Genuinely, I was disappointed to see this thing die. So look, as I'm sure you'd imagine, a game that looks like this is probably still nothing without its soundtrack. And well, the good news first off is that this game actually lets you use your own CDs as the soundtrack. So if you want to experience a game that looks like this while listening to Celine Dion's greatest hits, well, let me tell you, we finally have the technology. But on the other hand, you might not even want to use a CD because this game's original soundtrack is absolutely godlike. We've got over 20 tracks, unique music for each level and each boss, and pretty much all of it is amazing. Like, you can look at this game and think to yourself, what is the best possible soundtrack you could possibly have for this thing? Well, the answer is the soundtrack that came with it. It's high tempo, hard hitting, full of great beats, and perfectly complements the gameplay and visuals. It is genuinely top tier stuff. I've played through this thing maybe five or six times now. It's not a very long game, it's not the most challenging shooter out there, and it might be a bit much visually for some people, but I just love everything about this game. It is a blast from start to finish. It is a visual and audio feast, and honestly, it's games like this that make me glad I started doing this series, because I can see myself playing this a ton in the future, and I would have likely never came across it otherwise. It even has an English patch, which thankfully isn't needed to enjoy the game, but it does translate a few important sections like the seizure warning at the beginning and some of the options menus, so it is nice to have either way. So yeah, if you're a fan of tunnel shooters or games with striking visual aesthetics, this is the game for you. But really, IS is so good, I think any PlayStation fan should go out of their way to try this one. It is a genuine hidden gem and yet another stupidly good game with Squaresoft on the box. Who'd have guessed? <laughs> We will provide. Magnetism is getting unusually high. Oh, what's that? Volume 5's last game is Gamera 2000, which, in spite of what the game's title may lead you to believe, was actually released in April 1997. For those who are unaware, Gamera is a kaiju, a big, jet-powered turtle kaiju. As you can tell, he's pretty terrific. Now, I'm not a big kaiju guy, but I do have a particular soft spot for Gamera. The first kaiju movie I ever watched was the 1995 release Gamera Guardian of the Universe. I got it free with a copy of Play Nation magazine, and the DVD had this insane British dub of the film, which features a ton of added techno music that's not present in any other cut of the movie. <laughs> Thank you. 
so knowing very little about this game going in, I figured this would be your standard big monster fighting game, similar to a lot of the earlier Godzilla titles, but um, I was very wrong. Turns out Gamera 2000 is a Panzer Dragoon clone, only instead of a Dragoon, you now have a giant jet-powered turtle. It's also entirely in English, and also features live-action cutscenes. Is that what we call Gamera, Lieutenant? That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, we have hit the jackpot. So yeah, Gamera 2000 is pretty much a straight-up clone of Panzer Dragoon from a gameplay perspective. It's a rail shooter, you can fire a rapid shot, you can hold down the attack button to paint targets and release a homing shot, and you can also rotate your character 90 degrees to take on enemies coming from multiple directions. It's Panzer Dragoon on the PS1, and honestly, that's music to my goddamn ears. It also helps that the game is also really, really good. The game takes place across eight different stages, and it's pretty much non-stop action from start to finish. Well, we do stop from time to time, but it's worth it, I promise you. First things first, the gameplay here is pretty much perfect. You control your character and cursor using the D-pad, and movement overall just feels great. It's really easy to paint targets and take out any pesky projectiles with your auto shot. Everything here just feels so satisfying to play. You might have also noticed that it's not my fighter ship that's releasing the homing shots. That's actually our buddy Gamera over here. Gamera will fight alongside you during most of the game's missions. You have no direct control over Gamera, but he will be sure to attack any targets that you're happy to paint with your cursor. You can also charge up a special Gamera attack by holding down the circle button. This prompts Gamera to launch himself like a Koopa shell straight into enemies, and the longer you hold down the button, the longer his attack will last. It's a very powerful attack, but do be aware that you can't lock on to enemies while Gamera is performing this, and you also need to wait for the meter to cool down to use it again, so sometimes it actually pays to charge up smaller attacks to strike a nice balance and not be caught off guard. There are some levels where you'll be without Gamera's special attack, like during some of the boss fights where Gamera is taken on the enemy face to face, or even these speeder bike sections, which really make me think how good a Star Wars game could be in this style. Performance wise, the game does a great job too. It runs at a mostly smooth 30 frames per second, albeit with some significant drops in some of the later fights. But for the most part, the game runs pretty much flawlessly, and considering how hectic and fast paced this game is, the fact that it manages to maintain a smooth frame rate during the vast majority of its runtime is impressive in itself. Because really, for 1997, this is a fantastic looking PS1 game. Levels feature a ton of environmental detail, there is a lot of variety to the various locations you'll explore in each stage, and some of these bosses, my god, the scale on these things. There is not a boss fight in this game that doesn't feel like a big deal, and really that's all you can hope for in a game like this. And rounding out my seemingly never-ending praise for this game is its sound. And guys, this game's soundtrack, it's fucking wild. We've got vocals, guitars, traditional Japanese instruments, and a whole lot of techno, and it's so, so good. Really, I couldn't imagine a game about you and your giant pet turtle blowing shit up to have any other soundtrack after listening to this one, but even if you don't plan on playing the game, you need to check out this soundtrack as soon as you can. It's amazing. <laughs> And finally, saving the best for last, Gamera 2000, for whatever reason, is entirely in English and also, for whatever reason, features a whole heap of live-action cutscenes that are also voiced in English. There is a story here, but I can barely remember any of it because I was either losing my mind over what was happening on screen or was just too distracted by their accents to pay attention to anything. There isn't a huge amount of these in-game, but there thankfully is enough to warrant playing through the game for this stuff alone. It is low-budget B-movie schlock at its finest, with some of the best performances you will ever see in a game. Truly a gift. I'm ready! Okay, let's go. So yeah, I think it's safe to say I really enjoyed Gamera 2000. The fact that I'm a big fan of rail shooters is certainly a major factor, but genuinely, this is one of the funnest ones I've played, and may even be the best example of the genre on the PS1. 
It features a lot of the issues games in the genre have, like a very short runtime with low replayability, which might turn some people off. Some of the later levels can also be pretty difficult, and while the game does have infinite continues, the games feature no mid-level checkpoints and no health pickups, so newcomers might struggle during some of the game's bigger difficulty spikes. But really, all this stuff is minor criticism. At least the game has a family mode, whatever that means. I'm sure it's probably nice. You know what? I'm a little mad that this game never came out in the West. It didn't even need to be translated. It was already good to go. I guess the licensing around Gamera might have been a bit tricky, or maybe the character just wasn't popular enough over here. Who's to say? But this is one of those games that would have been, without a doubt, considered a cult classic had it been released over here, and I'm sure it already is to those who have played it before. So yeah, in conclusion, if you didn't know about Gamera 2000 before, well, now you do. Another excellent gaming experience on the PlayStation that has it all. Great gameplay, excellent visuals, a wonderful soundtrack, and top tier cheesy live action cutscenes. Do not miss out on this one. And with that, it's time to bring a close to Volume 5. We got to check out one of the very first games released on the PlayStation, one of the console's most visually impressive and fun shooters, and a game with possibly the best live-action cutscenes on the console. As is tradition, at the end of each episode, we've got to slot each of today's games into a tier list. Is the game a must-play? Is it worth trying if you like the look of it? Is the game just kinda meh? Is the game trash and not worth your time? Or did I hit a brick wall and found the game unplayable due to the language barrier? Well, with Volume 5, we see Motor 2 and Grand Prix making its way into Tri-Tier, and both IS and Gamera 2000 debuting as the first two Japan-only games to make it into must-play tier. Motor 2 and Grand Prix is very much an early PlayStation title. It's very simple, and it's pretty low on content, but there's no denying the racing here is still rock-solid and fun to this day. The game even looks pretty great for its age, with clean, colourful visuals and interesting track design. Is it as good as its follow-up? Eh, uh, not quite, but for fans of cartoony racing games with that little extra dash of early PS1 charm, Motor 2 and Grand Prix is still worth checking out. IS internal section is no lie, probably the game I've liked the most out of any game I've played in this series so far, and that includes obscure and forgotten PS1 games. The gameplay is tight, the bosses are great, the music is incredible, and the visuals are genuinely next level for the console. I know this type of game may not be for everybody, and it's unashamedly a game that favours style above all else, but the game beneath all that gorgeous aesthetic is still one of the PlayStation's best shooters and should not be missed by anybody. And as for Gamma 2000, well, I didn't think a game could come and challenge IS for the crown so quickly, but here we are. As a self-proclaimed rail shooter fanboy, this is pretty much everything I look for in a game. Great controls, great action, great bosses, great soundtrack, and a treasure trove of B-movie goodness thanks to the live-action cutscenes. Genuinely, between Gamera and IS, these are two games you need to go out of your way to try as soon as you can. Some of the coolest Japan-only experiences on the console, and genuinely, the reason why I love doing this series. You never really know what you're gonna get, but when the wheel provides, oh baby, does it provide. Now before I say goodbye, I do just want to give you guys a little update regarding the show's format. We are now 5 episodes into both the Obscure and Japan only series, and I've decided to shake up the format somewhat. I've been reading people's feedback, and I want to try and make the show better going forward. I'll share more in an update video that I'll post on the channel shortly that will go into a bit more detail, but I think you guys should be pretty happy with what I have in store. But for now, I'd like to say a big thank you for watching. It's nice to see so many people sticking with me throughout the series, and it's always a pleasure to put these videos together for you, so I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're hankering for more PS1 content, well, there's always plenty more over on the channel and if you can make sure to subscribe or drop a like or comment every bit of support really goes a long way i'll be back real soon for some more japan only video games but until then take it easy be kind to yourselves and don't forget to praise the wheel